Okay. Uh, let me silence this thing here. Okay. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the saints who have gone before us. We give you thanks for those who confessed our faith in Christ alone in the 16th century, and we ask that you would be with us now that we might learn from them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so I just wanted to, to hit one, one thing. I, I, I kind of forget how much I said about it, so I'm just going to go back real briefly, and then we'll pick up where we were. But um, Article 9 uh, concerning baptism, there's a few interesting things about that, and I, I forget how much I said last time. Um, but um, there's a couple places where Martin Luther specifically defends infant baptism. Uh, one of them is in the large catechism. And um, he says he says several things, uh, one of which is we don't baptize because someone believes. And he interestingly says, if we only baptize those who believed, we couldn't baptize anyone. I mean, you know, we follow the eighth commandment. We take someone at their word. If someone tells us that they believe, we accept that. And yet. We're, we're, we're perfectly aware that, uh, you know, Scripture says God is true, all men are liars. Uh, we're perfectly aware that there can be ulterior motives and other kinds of things in whatever human beings say. And so Luther said, if you want to be sure that somebody believes, you can't baptize anyone. He says, we baptize everyone because Christ commands, because that's Christ's word, and we trust that word more than the word of me or you or anyone else that tells us what we think about anything. Um, so there's that aspect to it. And then I think I did mention, you know, uh, when, um, when Mary uh, approaches Elizabeth, Elizabeth's baby uh, jumps in the womb. Uh, it says in the Psalms that, um, God has founded a bulwark out of the mouth of babes, and it's clear in the Hebrew that that means a very young child. Um, so there are these scriptural examples of children um, uh, believing, and um, so we we don't baptize because we're sure anyone believes, but we we do in these defenses of infant baptism. Luther says. Uh, we assume the child believes. Uh, I read a real interesting article a ways back about, it was written by a Baptist, and he was saying, um, we, we Baptists, uh, we act as if our children believe anyway. We assume that they believe. We want them to be a certain age before we'll sort of take their word for it, which, as you know, as Luther says, is always dangerous to, to take any human being's word. But we want them to be a certain age before we believe them that they believe, and yet uh, we treat them as if they're Christians. And, and so that's, in many ways, quite similar to what Luther is saying in part of this defense of infant baptism, is that uh, we, we assume they have faith. And I think I did last time talk about, you know, what exactly is faith. And uh, there's very intellectual definitions of what faith is, um, but uh, we we these the, all these things are are in a sense hidden to us. Uh, we follow the eighth commandment. We take people at their word when they say we believe in Christ, um, but you don't want to start founding things on that. That's a that's a slippery slope. And that's why I feel that after whether. I don't feel like they have the right to say no. I mean, that, you know, they they don't know. Sure. Well, uh, that that would that would land in that direction. Yeah. I mean, there's there's some other things. I'm, I'm kind of curious. I, I do want to talk to you in private about that situation, but. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, Christ Christ commands us to do this, and um, <laughs> when someone actually requests it, we say thank God. <laughs> somebody's still interested <laughs> you know that's 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 my reaction at least okay um so i think we left off on page now what happened to my page 45 oh so that was the problem huh all right Give me one second. Give me one second and I'll read aloud from page 45. 
Yeah, I was looking at the numbers. I see. I Of course, I didn't know it. Okay. Are you sure we didn't read page 45? This seems familiar to me. Okay. <laughs> Did we do it concerning the Lord's Supper last time? No. No? Okay. Concerning the Supper of the Lord. Concerning the Lord's Supper, they teach, which means our churches, that the body and blood of Christ are truly present and are distributed to those who eat the Lord's Supper. They disapprove of those who teach otherwise. Now, we'll talk more about this. This co comes up in a different way in just a couple of articles concerning the use of the sacraments. Um, but, of course, uh, this is something that happens at the time of the Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther attacks the church's teaching of uh, what he generally calls the mass. Uh, the mass can have many meanings, but it, it generally refers to what we might call Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper. And he attacks it from the position that the church has slowly turned this into a sacrifice. And so the language around the Lord's Supper in the late medieval period is that the priest is sacrificing Christ up to God. Uh, the priest asks that the sacrifice of the congregation that he is making would be acceptable to the Lord. And Luther says that this is all backwards. Uh, the easiest way to remember this is the direction. The direction of a sacrifice is this way. Uh, the direction of a sacrament, Luther says, truly is this way. It's a gift of God. It's something that God is given to you. So, um, this is his reform, and you could really say that this is the whole Reformation in the nutshell. Um, the, 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 the sacrament becomes very, very important. It, of course, is very, very important, but it becomes kind of the singular important thing throughout the Middle Ages. And um, there's various reforms in the church based on piety surrounding uh, Holy Communion. Uh, but... Uh, that's Luther's critique of this, that this is a gift, not a sacrifice. Now, another very powerful thing that helps the Reformation actually succeed. Uh, the Reformation just doesn't start in Wittenberg and then spread all over Germany and in other parts of Europe and up into Scandinavia uh, just because the theology is so great. I mean, that is certainly a an important historical causal factor in the creation of the Reformation and that it, 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 so many people become aligned with it that hundreds of years later, when Swedish people come over to Iron Mountain, they, they start this church. You know, that's largely how the Lutheran church in America uh, exists because of uh, large groups of people coming from Europe and, and founding it. Um, so theology is, is a part of it. It's always difficult to say exactly. I mean, like I said, when it comes to faith itself, you can't get out uh, your history book and say this person believed and that person didn't believe. It doesn't work that way. There are other historical causal factors that cause uh, Luther's preaching to spread, and uh, one of them is anti-clericism. Um, I, I think there's actually an article in here. I, I forget if we got into it or not. Um, when the the clergy were their own estate in society, they weren't subject to the laws of the city, of the municipality. And so if a clergy person got in trouble, they didn't go to court. They went to a church court. And as you can imagine, this led to a lot of problems, uh, shenanigans and, and whatnot. And um, so... Uh, a lot of what happens during the Reformation is attacks on the clergy. Luther will, of course, attack a great deal of what the clergy is teaching. Um, and, and you know, he's, he's very aggressive and vitriolic about it at times. Um, but others will try to attack the clergy in other ways. And really, the clergy's power 
comes from the mass, from this idea that through their ordination, they are the ones who have the ability to turn the bread and wine into Christ's body and blood. Um, that gives them special prerogatives, special authority. Um, and uh, we don't believe, of course, that this is exactly what's happening, but we do stick with Christ's words that it is the body and blood of Christ. Well, people come in and they, they want to attack the clergy and they say, well, if we're going to overthrow this system, this is precisely what we have to attack. The idea that the bread and wine are actually Christ's body and blood. And Luther in 1523 writes about how greatly tempted he was to um, do exactly that, to claim that this is not what's happening in Holy Communion. Because he said, if I, if, I could have, if I would have done that, I could have destroyed the papacy in one blow. That would have been the end of it. And he said, uh, but the words of Scripture were too strong for me meaning what Christ actually said on the night when he was betrayed, kind of like in 1521 when Luther refused to recant, and he said, uh, my conscience is bound to the word of God. Well, this is a similar thing, even though he saw that there would have been great political advantages in doing this, he understood that the words of Scripture were too, still, were too strong, and he stuck with it. So, uh, we'll talk more about this as we get to the article of concerning the use of the sacraments. It talks more about this. Question. So what does that get the Catholics? They, they would not allow me to take communion uh, as a Catholic ceremony. What's the reasoning of that? Is that he has exclusive power to give communion? Or they only choose to give it to or what, what are they well, they're they're arguing a form of church discipline that and and all churches do have church discipline to one extent or another. It's usually hopefully kind of in the, in the background. Um, but they what they would be saying is that you're not a member of uh, this church. Uh, you don't agree with all of our teachings, and therefore we're not going to give you holy communion. Now, they would also probably say you're not a member of the true church. Uh, now, ever since Vatican II, that's a little more fuzzy uh, among Catholics and depends which Catholic you're talking to. And certainly, just as in there are a variety of practices in Lutheran churches, there are a variety of practices in Catholic churches. Uh, I know of situations in which Catholic priests specifically uh, try to get everyone to have communion, whether you're Catholic or not. Um, but certainly official church teaching is that you have to uh, be in communion with the church. But they all feel that if you take communion as a Lutheran church, that's not communion. Not communion. Um, I don't know that they would say that there's no real presence at a Lutheran church. Um, they would tell their own members not to take it at a Lutheran church because and it's true that the sacrament of Holy Communion is, uh, among other things, it's secondary, but it is a sacrament of unity. You know, we are, we are, we're together when we're taking Holy Communion. And they would say that we're a schismatic church. So if you're a member of the church that's not schismatic, you don't want to be receiving sacraments at a church that is schismatic. That's, that's their point of view. Except that it's valid. Uh, I, I would think so. I mean, for in, here, you know, the sacraments are different. They do different things. But one way of thinking about it is baptism. If someone is baptized in a Lutheran church and then becomes Catholic, they're not going to rebaptize you in accordance with uh, what we read there. They agree with that aspect of the Augsburg Confession that you don't rebaptize. So now, of course, there is a uh, an especially big difference, be, and even more so in the Catholic Church between the two sacraments, because uh, all Christians have always agreed you don't have to be ordained to do baptism. Um, you know, we have we have even in our in our hymnal still today we have orders for emergency baptism, and in the old days uh, midwives were trained on how to do baptisms if it looked like the child would not 
uh, live to make it to church to be baptized, midwives would do that. And even in the Catholic Church, women can baptize. So uh, they would make that distinction. We, of course, make some distinctions there. Our, ours aren't quite as hard, as hard and fast as theirs are. The I.O. is nothing. <clears throat> when I would go to a Catholic, it was Catholic. But then, like, if I was going to a Catholic wedding or whatever, how do they know? You go up for communion, how do they know? Well, the last Catholic wedding. I gotta confess, I did that one time. Yeah. <laughs> then you felt guilty. Yeah. Then you feel guilty. I don't, yeah. because it was, I, I knew that it was at a funeral. It was like. But we were, we're at a wedding, and the, the priest is in Milwaukee, and the priest said, Well, if you're not Catholic, he, he said it in a flowery, nice way. He said, we don't, we don't, yeah, we don't, we don't, oh, yeah. we don't want to do this. Yeah. It's hurtful. And it's, 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 there's an exclusivity there that just doesn't They have their own rules. <laughs> well, Jim's dad said it's all very, very Catholic. His mother had passed now, but she yeah. was what I call old school Catholic. Started coming to church with him here. She did not like it at all. I think she would rather that he didn't go to church. <laughs> I'm serious. I do. I believe. And it. she would, oh, you know, ask him, Did you take <laughs> I got along with her most times. <laughs> but I just couldn't believe that. You wouldn't want your son to have the gift of God. Yeah. I mean, it, just, just. To say one thing for this, I'm currently uh, teaching American Lutheran church history, um, and it is a it is a very American thing to be sort of inherently ecumenical. Uh, people are cooperating all the time. Um, the first, the very first uh, Lutherans that come to what will become the United States come from Amsterdam. They were uh, Germans, uh, you know. At 1555, there's the Peace of Augsburg, and everybody in Germany, all the rulers get to decide that we're Catholic or Lutheran. Well, sometimes the Lutheran wouldn't have a child, or the Catholic wouldn't have a child, and things could flip because the cousin was the opposite confession of faith, you know. And so some some of these are these are Lutherans that fled a territory in Germany that suddenly became Catholic, and the Dutch were very uh, open. Uh, they believed in freedom of conscience and, you know, not entirely freedom of religion as the Constitution would have it, but they were quite tolerant. And, and some Lutherans fled to go to Amsterdam. And then they were some of the first ones that came to New York City and areas around there. And then uh, the other earliest Lutherans in the United States were Swedes who set, settled around the Delaware River, where I lived in Princeton, New Jersey, where George Washington would later cross the river on Christmas Eve. Um, and the Swedes and the Episcopalians would often sort of share priests. They would do services for each other. Uh, Muhlenberg, who was German but was from Philadelphia, served some of these Swedish congregations at times, and he would, he would do services for the Episcopalians. So uh, this sort of cooperation is inherently American. Um, for better and, and for worse. But, you know, people, Christians in Europe did not really think that way. They understood that they had different confessions of faith. Why do I mention this? Well, because uh, when I was serving in British Columbia, you know, there was, I was serving largely people who had grown up in Europe, many of them in the Ukraine, a few others in Germany and Poland. And there were several married couples who were half Lutheran and half Catholic. And uh, the the Catholics would not commune at our church. They would come every single Sunday and not receive communion. And this is simply what they grew up understanding, just as we kind of grow up with a more uh, cooperative understanding of how things work. <laughs> Okay, well, we've spent a lot of time on that one. Yeah. Let's, are you sure I didn't read concerning confession last week? This seems all so familiar. Well, the thing is, see, the thing is, is that I read the whole Augsburg Confession twice a day, so I can't remember. <laughs>
<laughs> Concerning confession, our churches teach that private absolution should be retained in the churches, although an enumeration of all faults in confession is not necessary, for this is impossible according to the Psalm 19, but who can detect their errors? So, all of medieval piety revolves around uh, the Mass, Holy Communion. But most people understand that the Mass is for the priest. The priest is representing you. That's literally what, what priest means when it comes to offering up sacrifices, offering up prayers. The priest stands in as a representative of the people. That's what he does in the Old Testament. Uh, so people almost never take communion. So that in, in 1215, the Fourth Lateran Council has to mandate that all Christians receive communion once per year. Uh, this happens during Holy Week, almost always for everybody. Um, and it's tightly connected with the sacrament of penance. Um, before you receive communion during Holy Week, uh, you have to go to confession, you have to do penance. That is not the only time in the year, though, that most people do penance. Uh, obviously, it varies widely. We like to think about the old days that, you know, everybody was going to church four times a week and everybody was very religious. Well, there were all kinds of people back then, too. In general, uh, people came to church more often, but uh, exactly what they came to church for would vary. Um, in the early years of the Lutheran Church, the Lutheran Mass, as they continued to call it, would last three hours. And generally, people would just show up for the middle hour <laughs> where, where, where the sermon was. And then they would go home. So there's there's all kinds of different practice. But there are there is a great deal, a great percentage of the people are are pious to the extent that they go to penance uh, fairly often. And uh, when you go to penance, you have to enumerate each and every one of your sins. And if you don't enumerate them, then the forgiveness that you're given doesn't take care of the penalty. And so does, how does that work? Well, then you go to purgatory and you spend a certain amount of time in purgatory to pay uh, for the, the sins that you have not done proper penance for in this life. Um, so what the Augsburg Confession is saying here is that uh, we're not getting rid of confession absolution, um, but we're putting the stress on the absolution. The point is not your words. It's 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 kind of the same thing as in communion. It's it's changing the direction. It's not so much your words that are going to God. It's God's word that is coming to you that's most important. Um, well, is there is confession still a part of it? Yes, it is. Um, you know, we confess our sins when we do public absolution every Sunday, uh, but private absolution is still important. There's things that you don't want to talk about in front of everybody. And so it's precisely, as Luther says in the large catechism, precisely those sins that are troubling you. You're not trying to make sure your list is exhaustive. You're talking about the particular things that bother you. Uh, how I, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I think I hurt their feelings. Or something worse, you know, actual uh, real sins, as Luther calls them at times. He says we have a lot of imaginary sins, but... Christ dies for real sins. Um, so this is this is what uh, private confession is going to be all about. Uh, concerning repentance. Concerning repentance, our churches teach that those who have fallen after baptism can receive forgiveness of sins whenever they are brought to repentance, and that the church should impart absolution to those who return to repentance. Now, properly speaking, re repentance consists of two parts. One is contrition, or the terrors that strike the conscience when sin is recognized, the other is faith, which is brought to life by the gospel or the absolution. This faith believes that sins are forgiven on account of Christ, consoles the conscience, and liberates it from terrors. Thereupon, good works, which are the fruit of repentance, should follow. They condemn both the Anabaptists who deny that those who have once been justified can lose the Holy Spirit, and also those who contend that some may attain such perfection in this life that they cannot sin. Um, I think probably the best way to sum this up <laughs> is to say that the evangelical Lutheran view on life is that it is daily repentance. It is daily return to baptism. It is daily 
realizing that I am a sinner and that I need Christ's help and thereby uh, returning to his word of forgiveness and his promise of new life in which uh, we won't be like this anymore, in which we won't have to daily repent of all of our sins. Um, I had another thought there. Uh, um, yeah, an another aspect of this is, um, as I was saying, exactly how the priestly authority is attacked. And so you'll hear among, this is very pop popular among Protestants and, and the United States inherent religion is sort of a non-Lutheran Protestantism. And so you probably heard this before, and I, I, I've heard it from Lutherans, um, that, you know, I don't need to confess my sin to anyone. Uh, I can go straight to God. Well, of course, this is true. Uh, and Luther says this at times, you know, we should always, when, when we pray the Lord's Prayer, we're, we're confessing our sins to God. Uh, but as we saw in the earlier article concerning the office of the ministry, you know, God gets his word out through other human beings. He, he speaks in a mediated way through people. Uh, in the sacraments, he even uses other things in creation to get his word to us, but he's always speaking through people. And so we have things like in the Gospel of John, when Christ comes to the room after his resurrection and comes through the locked doors, what does he say? He says, receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Uh, in, in the Gospel of Mark, it says, uh, whatever is loosed on earth is loosed in heaven. Whatever is, is retained on earth is retained in heaven. So uh, that's another important aspect of this confession of faith is another way we're trying not to throw out the baby with the bathwater is that uh, we understand that God does use mediation. He uses human beings to speak his words and that he works through the church. Um, he, he works through the office of the ministry, and he works uh, through all of us in other ways. Um, but what we're not saying, this is not a, some sort of a spiritualism in which the fact that another human being is saying something uh, necessarily means that it's not really from God. We're not, we're not sitting around waiting for special messages from God to come out of the darkness. Uh, he has... He has established his church. He's established human beings to forgive our sin, to remind us of our hope in Christ. Uh, he, he works through his creation in that way. Do you understand what I'm saying? How um, certain types of, of Protestantism can, can kind of frown on the idea of, of uh, human beings having authority in that way. So that that's what that's what the a large part of what the retur retaining of confession is about. Okay, now we're now we're over to page forty six. We're still not done with uh, that article I was reading. Um, however, also condemned are the Novat Novatians who denied absolution to those who sinned after baptism. Also rejected are those who do not teach that a person obtains forgiveness of sins through faith, but only through their own satisfactions. So that's, that's taking a shot at the sacrament of uh, penance. Uh, also rejected are those who teach that canonical satisfactions are necessary to pay for an eternal tor torment or purgatory. That's further into the weeds of the official church teaching on how penance works. Uh, certain things get reserved for certain categories and they have to be dealt with in different ways. Um, but just the whole thing is saying uh, we reject what has come to be the basic um, premise of penance, that you have to have these various types of attitude and you have to go through this specific process and you have to make your own satisfactions for your sins. Um, we, we, we think repentance is simply noticing that you're a sinner and, and then believing Christ's words of forgiveness of your sins. Well, then why in the service did you, is it made a point that uh, as an ordained minister, I forgive you all your sins? 
Yeah, because because of uh, uh, Article 14 is going to talk about this some, and when, Article 5 on the Office of the Ministry um, is that we don't want anyone publicly doing this who hasn't been orderly called to do so. Um, so uh, Luther is very clear, uh, and, and the church of, of the time didn't like it, uh, we are all, as baptized Christians, enabled to preach the gospel, and preaching the gospel simply means and it includes uh, forgiving sins. So we're all, uh, by means of baptism, able to forgive sins in the name of Christ. We're able to forgive sins with Almighty God's authority. We can all do that. And, of course, uh, the pastor is often the last one who has the ability to do that. It's, you know, this is, these are things that families do among themselves. Or uh, one of my teachers would always talk about how uh, the pastor should figure out who the confessors are in the community. And he said one of them is always the barber, or the hairdresser. These are the people who hear people's confessions of their sins. They hear their doubt. They hear their despair. And so all of us are licensed to do that. But when we publicly assemble, we don't want any kind of controversies over who's supposed to be doing that. We don't. Uh, <laughs> I, I did my dissertation on Strasbourg. And at one point, um, an evangelical preacher starts uh, preaching at one of the churches in town. And the, the canons, who are largely the choir members and who think they control the church, they're all priests, uh, th they don't like this. And so they, they find their own preacher to go on a Sunday. And uh, he gets in the pulpit for the first time, and the evangelical preacher goes up there and wrestles with him for a while. <laughs> and he gets, the, he gets the canon's choice out of there, and he never comes back. But it's generally, as entertaining as that is, that's generally a bad idea. <laughs> so we do want to, uh, we do want to uh, choose a specific person to be doing that. And so, uh, you know, there, there's good points and, and possibly some bad points about the mention of ordination specifically at that moment. It's not uh, like I have some superpower to know whether or not you're truly repenting of these sins. I have no additional power, uh, but I do have authority that's been given to me by God through the church. And so it is in, in a good way uh, to mention that. You could uh, give a, a, a public absolution without saying, oh, by the way, remember I'm ordained. You could just say it straight through. And, you know, uh, we looked at the language when Jeff did the service a couple of weeks ago. And we said, as a baptized uh, member of the Church of Christ, it's always kind of a foggy area when you have a fill-in, because, of course, he hasn't been examined to do this publicly, uh, but I have, and I've said, hey, Jeff, do this for me. <laughs> so where exactly those lines are, are always a question, but we don't want to lie and have someone who's not ordained, say, as an ordained minister, so we, we change the language. Um, all right, concerning the use of the sacraments, this is Article 18 we're at now. Concerning the use of sacraments, it is taught that the sacraments are instituted not only to be signs by which people may recognize Christians outwardly, um, but also as signs and testimonies of God's will toward us in order thereby to awaken and strengthen our faith. Okay, so this is... This is Distinguishing the Lutherans from the other Protestants that are that are springing up, who are saying that this is not truly Christ's body and blood. That's really where the fight occurs. There's also some differences in baptism, but the argument occurs surrounding the Lord's Supper. Well, if you don't believe that this is truly the body and blood of Christ, and then some of the groups in, in accordance with that, don't believe that this is actually forgiving our sins by hearing these words and eating and drinking, uh, well, what are they? Well, other groups begin to say these are ordinances of, of Christ. These are things he wants us to do, and these are ways that we sort of visibly acknowledge the unity of the church, uh, visibly testify to the world that we are the church because we're doing what Christ is doing. 
and the confession is saying, well, that, yeah, that, that's true in a sense. That we are, we are, we have our unity in these sacraments, and we we testify we are the church. As often as you receive the this supper, uh, you proclaim the death of the Lord. Paul says in in Corinthians. So it's not like those things aren't true, but those are sort of the secondary, lesser aspects of it. Um, what it most importantly is is signs and testimonies of God's will toward us in order to awaken and strengthen our faith. The, the sacraments are words from God in which he's express, expressing his pleasure with us through the forgiveness of sins. He's saying, I no longer condemn you. I forgive you, and therefore I'm well pleased with you. So that sentence is kind of written trying to distinguish uh, the Lutherans from some of the other Protestant groups that are springing up by 1530. Now, the next sentence distinguishes what we believe from what the late medieval church believed. This is why they also require faith and are rightly used when received in faith for the strengthening of faith. I mean, what do you do when someone says, I forgive you? All you can do is trust that that's true. And, and again, this comes out of our context in which we're human beings and we realize we're sinners and we realize all human beings are sinners and we realize that lying is a very real possibility. We probably at some point all of us had someone forgive us and then we find out later that, well, they don't really forgive us. So, so, so this is when, when, when someone speaks to you, you either trust or distrust what they're saying. And of course, when all God, Almighty God speaks to us, we can trust that he's speaking the truth. And so this is why they require faith. Uh, whenever you're using human language, you're using human language that is in the law. Uh, Luther says, when, when, a, when the gospel is spoken, the words take on new meanings. Uh, they're, still, they're still words, they're still used in our language, um, but they're doing something new. And so all these words, we have to be careful require faith. Well, that could easily make faith in our work. It could be saying, well, God does all the promising and all this, but uh, he still requires faith from you. That's still the one thing on the checklist you got to get. Uh, that's, that's not what the Augsburg Confession is saying. It's saying that, that a word of promise requires faith. A word of promise does no good if there's no trust in it. And so it's saying that the whole purpose, but remember what it says before, it doesn't say that the word of promise requires faith, it says it awakens and strengthens faith. So the word that requires faith at the same time creates the faith that it requires. But the second sentence is reminding us that faith is the way that these sacraments do us any good. Uh, why do you have to say that? Well, because of the next paragraph here. Rejected, therefore, are those who teach that the sacraments justify ex opere operato without faith and who do not teach that this faith should be added so that the forgiveness of sins, which is obtained through faith and not our work, may be offered here. It is going against this late medieval uh, teaching that, which goes hand in hand with the idea that the sacraments are a sacrifice. Uh, you know, what's the most important part of a sacrifice? The doing, the, the offering up to God. And so the church was teaching that these sacrifice works these these sacraments work ex opere operato, which is Latin. Let's see if it translates by the mere performance of an act. Uh, the literal translation would be out of the to doing of the done or something like that. That that you you uh, simply because the sacrament is given to you, this gives you grace. This. Uh, does something for you, uh, depending on what the sacrament is and what the circumstance is, that can vary. Um, but the teaching is, is that you don't even have to believe in this because God has ordained this and the church is doing it the right way. And therefore, you can be sure that this is helping you. Right. Uh, they, you don't stress that or anything. But, you know, we talked about the problem of, uh, of Donatism, 
in which uh, the priest baptizes you and then renounces Christ because the emperor is going to kill him, uh, then is your baptism still good? And there were arguments about that. And of course, the correct answer that the church came to is yes, the baptism is good because it's God's word. Well, the church kind of took this idea one step too far. I mean, what's the purpose of saying that your baptism was valid? To strengthen your faith. So you can say, I am baptized. I am a child of God. God has forgiven my sin and promised me life. Um, the church tried to take that one step further and say that uh, because Christ has instituted these things and we've done them, uh, nothing depends on, it's not for any greater purpose. It's just there it is. And, and the ultimate problem with this is not kind of that it puts too much stress on the actual words of God or the actual sacrament. Uh, the problem with this is that it kind of, it wants to turn God's promises into a law. That's, that's the ultimate end of ex opere operato is uh, I checked it off my list. I, I received it like the church told me to, and therefore God has to uh, give me some sort of reward for this. And that's what happened in the late medieval period. So the Lutherans are, are trying to walk this very uh, thin path of, of not joining with other Protestants and saying, well, these sacraments are just kind of signs and symbols. They're not that important. And then they're also trying not to fall off to the other side, um, which sort of makes the sacraments so objective um, that the, the person receiving it, in a, in a sense, doesn't even matter. It's just a matter of fulfilling the law doing what God told you to do, and then it's all taken care of, and there's no room for faith there. Now, why does there need to be room for faith? Merely because they're promises, because faith is what receives a promise. And so in this ex opere operato, the promise is getting uh, perverted into a law. So this all goes together with the basic Lutheran teaching of the difference between the commandments on the one hand and forgiveness and promises on the other. They're, they're applying that distinction to what the sacraments are and what the sacraments are doing for sinners. Well, it gets a little complicated when we take a step back and, and deal with these, with these church doctrines, but... In the end, what they're saying is the sacraments are promises, and you can trust these. Um, one way to fall off that is to think that they're not promises, they're just symbols, and they're just marks of the church. Another way to fall off that is to think that in giving us these sacraments, what God is actually giving us is laws, things we have to do, and then if we do them, he's pleased with it. Instead, we're saying what they actually are are promises from God, and the only thing that a promise ever does is creates faith in those who receive the promise. So leave it at that if, if everything else is a little too complicated. feel better now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks for coming. And uh, see you next week.